First of all, welcome. My name is Mike Frank, and I'm the director for Hoover's Washington, D.C. office. I want to welcome everyone tonight. I especially want to welcome those of you who are here on date night. <laughs> we have a couple of people back here who, I guess for lack of social options, they have come here. Either that or they really like the wine, the beer, the food, and the discourse. So I Harry can't imagine Dennis, a better date. I can't either. I think, <laughs> think we'd revolutionize the social scene in Washington here. Uh, so tonight we have another in a series of uh, book events we've done with Craig Shirley since I've been here. I think it's our third, actually, Craig. Uh, Craig is a renowned biographer of Ronald Reagan. He's written about it was 1941, uh, the year. He has books already on the transom, on, on his, on his uh, tarmac, ready to be researched and written. Uh, he's changed his um, focus. Uh, now he's looking at a new f political figure, uh, former speaker uh, Newt Gingrich. And um, that's what we're here tonight to discuss, this new book. I've read it twice, and I highly recommend it. It is full of wonderful uh, observations and anecdotes and a storyline about a period in our history that I think is uh, especially uh, full of, uh, of intellectual battles, of significant uh, moments in the, in the institutional development of the Congress, of the demographic shifts politically, especially in the, in the South. Uh, a whole lot of those themes, and Craig does a terrific job of eliciting them in his book. So what I thought I'd do tonight is start off uh, with a question, an open-ended question. Uh, one thing Craig mentions early on is how you have a number of different major figures in the cons modern conservative movement. Uh, William F. Buckley, kind of the leader in scholarship. I would also argue in institution building. Uh, you have Ronald Reagan. Uh, leadership, but I would also argue that he played a very strong intellectual role in the conservative movement, uh, as we learned from uh, uh, in my own hand and the, the letters and things that were discovered that he had wrote uh, uh, longhand on his own. Uh, we have Antin Antonin Scalia, who was sort of the, kind of the leading intellectual light on, on the legal side of, of modern conservative jurisprudence. And then we have Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich would be the leader on tactics, on legislative. Uh, strategy on issues like that um, and on sort of the modern style of uh, full-throated, uh, no holes barred engagement in the House. And throughout the book, the House becomes the real focus of a lot of these major moments that we experienced in the late 70s and into the 80s and through 1994 when Craig ends the book. So Craig, let me start off by asking you, uh, you switch from your, your subject being Ronald Reagan to Newt Gingrich. They're very different kinds of people. Yes. Uh, they played very different roles, as you indicated, in the modern conservative movement. Could you kind of walk through how the challenge is different with Newt than it was with President Reagan and, uh, and how you dealt with that? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Michael. Thank you for inviting me here. Uh, Reagan burst on the political scene in 1964 uh, in a Republican Party that is almost dead. It's nominated Barry Goldwater, but the prospects against Lyndon Johnson are, are very dark. The Republican Party had been in the, in the, uh, in the minority since they had been in the New Deal. Uh, and there were, there were serious people, including Reagan himself for a time, who thought the Republican Party was, was too old, too decrepit, uh, and needed to be reformed and even possibly change its name because there were so many uh, problems attended. In yeah, yeah, 64. Mm -hmm. the, 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 Gingrich comes along, and, and of course Reagan does much to rebuild the Republican Party. In fact, mm -hmm. he, he does. He, he, and he re remakes the Republican Party into a conservative, populist, political movement that is, uh, that is constantly in motion. Uh, is, mm -hmm. That is in a state of, uh, of a political and economic revolution. Um, you know, it's funny is, is that uh, when he was, 1981, when he was pitching the tax cuts, which were radical at the time, absolutely radical. Mm -hmm. uh, he w gave a, a speech to a group of conservatives here in Washington. And he said, you know, it's, the tax cuts are, they're about the economy, yes, and they're about jobs. He said, but they're really about readdressing man's relationship to the state. And I thought, 
you know, I read that and I remember the time and I thought it was very, very profound. Who talks like that in Republican Party politics anymore? I mean, mm -hmm. certainly not Donald Trump mm -hmm. uh, is that, but Gingrich does. Mm -hmm. And Gingrich understands the concept of the allocation of power and where it belongs. Does it belong with the state or does it belong with the individual as the framers and founders intended mm -hmm. uh, in 1776 and 1787? Um, and so Gingrich, um, but he, he takes over or he becomes a leader in a party that's in some ways much better shape, but in some ways much worse shape because by 1992 and, and George Bush's defeat mm -hmm. is the Republican Party is scattered. It's, it's, there are neocons and theocons and economic conservatives and social conservatives and foreign policy conservatives and isolationist uh, Republicans. And they're, 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 it's, it's, so how do you put this, how do you put the toothpaste back in the tube? That's what Gingrich. Can I read your, your lengthy description of all those categories? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, yeah, sure. Uh, when you threw into this stew, Reagan Democrats, neocons, theocons, libertarians, globalists, isolationists, police state Republicans, Vichy Republicans, intellectualists, moralists, absolutionists, country club Republicans, bowling league Republicans, Ivy League Republicans, Prairie League Republicans, sellout Republicans, <laughs> access selling Republicans, lapsed Republicans, pink elephant Republicans, which I'd like you to explain to me. <laughs> um, teetotaling Republicans, preppy Republicans, blue collar Republicans, K Street Republicans, Main Street Republicans, Wall Street Republicans, street walking <laughs> Republicans. I don't want to know what that is. <laughs> no <-nuts laughs> Those Republicans, are Sun Best Republicans, and so on. Gypsy Moth, Omega House Republicans, Gold Standard Republicans, Welfare State Republicans, Disestablishmentarianism Republicans and statist Republicans. So that's a long list, a lot of divisions within the party. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but before we get too far ahead of that, let's go back to some of Newt Gingrich's earlier, his development, his intellectual development right. especially. He starts off running for Congress, and he was not, um, in his early statements, his early campaigns, an across-the-board movement, conservative. No. He was open to things like ag subsidies. He was open to, to protectionism. Te textiles. Yeah, textile. Environmentalists. Textiles. So like, walk through a little bit about where he started off and how he kind of started to root himself within the, the political system and what issues started to emerge and how he changed. Well, don't forget is, is that he's running in 74. The first time he runs is in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Which you know was the yellowest, doggest state of the of the South, other mm -hmm. than other than Arkansas, is that there was only one Republican mm -hmm. in the congressional delegation, Blen, right. Ben Blackburn, mm -hmm. and the House, the the state House, the state Senate, and the governorship are just it's all everything's Democratic. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all there's to it. Dog catchers, are, you know, dog, people voted for. So dog, dog catching Republicans too. Yeah, I didn't mention those, but I should. <laughs> I should mongrel Republicans. <laughs> Um, and so this is an uphill climb. So his first campaign, his second campaign, his third campaign, which he finally wins the third time, mm -hmm. he, he almost never mentions republicanism, but he does mention conservatism a lot. But he doesn't understand conservatism, I don't think, in, in 74. Mm -hmm. He's a college professor, so he's part of the, college, part of the culture of mm -hmm. the academy, and he embraces a lot of the nostrums of the academy at the time, especially environmentalism and other mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and nonetheless, he comes very, very close. In, in 1974, the year of Watergate, uh, he comes within 6,000 votes of beating the incumbent, mm -hmm. uh, Jack Flynn. He tries again in 76, uh, runs a better campaign, but loses again by 6,000 votes. Mm -hmm. Finally wins in uh, 78, which is kind of an anti-Carter year, although mm -hmm. Carter's still very popular in Georgia, uh, but he's able to beat back that mm -hmm. and, and defeat Virginia Shepard, who was a very mm -hmm. popular local state senator. State senator yeah. But you can see his progress mm -hmm. as he is evolving from kind of a, uh, kind of a, not a country club Republican, but a status Republican to 78, where he's, where he's a complete revolutionary. Mm -hmm. He's uh, heavily influenced by, by Kemp Roth and Kemp, mm -hmm. uh, which came out in 1977 and came mm -hmm. fully formed as legislation in 78. And this really changes him. Also, the Panama Canal treaties mm -hmm. uh, had a great effect. He led the, uh, the campaign in Georgia to mm -hmm. get petitions signed to overturn the Panama Canal treaties. Mm -hmm. uh, and he throws himself into that. So that also changes his outlook. And of course, Reagan's influence himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he is actually, as far as I can tell, the first politician 
who, who advocated Reagan take on Gerald Ford in the 76 primaries, he wrote an op-ed in the Baltimore Sun in 1974. Newt Gingrich did. Yes, in 74. Yeah, mm -hmm. when, when everybody was figuring, you know, okay, mm -hmm. Jerry's in there, he'll be nominated in 76, and we'll see how he does. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, there was no primary challenger really coming forward to take on, uh, to take, uh, to come forward to take on Ford. Mm -hmm. So Gingrich, as far as I can tell, is the first Republican, I wouldn't call him a national Republican, mm -hmm. although he was getting national media, mm -hmm. even in his 74 campaign, because he was doing a lot of very interesting, uh, innovative things in that campaign. Actually, that's interesting, because that's a different style than the norm within the Republican Party. Absolutely. I remember the old joke that the Democrats, uh, when they select their presidential nominees, it's sort of like a summer fling. Right. And for Republicans, it's more like an arranged marriage. And, <laughs> you, know, you have this guy out there saying the opposite of what that norm had been. Sure. That's, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that comes up repeatedly um, as well, I was really struck by this. And I remember uh, in my exposure to this speaker and then congressman too, uh, remembering this, but it, you pulled it together throughout the book which is his courtship of African Americans. Yes. Uh, especially that one newspaper in his district. I mean, maybe yes. you could talk a little bit about his instinctive um, sense, maybe that's the optimism he had, that, that the policies he espoused, the Kemp approach, the Reagan approach, his own instincts there, would be very, very appealing to the African American voters. Yeah. The Atlanta um, uh, Daily, Daily World, uh, Daily World mm -hmm. yes, was a, uh, was a black owned newspaper, African American, uh, was founded by uh, by Republican African Americans after the Civil War, mm -hmm. and uh, was very was was an active, vital presence in the community, and had waged uh, wielded a lot of political influence. Mm -hmm. uh, and they ha were they never liked Jack Flint. Jack Flint was uh, was a Jim Crow Democrat, and at the annual as an int as, as a illustration of him mm -hmm. at the annual congressional breakfast. Uh, with, with the Georgia delegation, he refused to sit at the same table with Andrew Young, who was then, hmm. you know, ran to be Carter's mm -hmm. ambassador to the UN, but then was a congressman mm -hmm. from Georgia, and he refused to sit at the same table with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's right there. But Newt, I think, um, he acquired this. I think part, a lot of it came d due to the fact that his father was career army, mm -hmm. and he moved around a lot. Mm -hmm. He moved around, and he saw uh, what a lot of people realized is is that the army was colorblind. Mm -hmm. Was that anybody could serve and anybody could advance, and the, the, your race did not matter whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that that educated him a lot on the whole issue of. And Kemp uh, is like that too. Yes, very much so. Like professional but football. Yeah. professional mm -hmm. football. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. One thing um, I was struck. Yeah, by. Jack used to joke that he, you know, showered with more with more black men than you'd ever met or something like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> well, we'll stop it at that. Um, <laughs> yeah. A couple points you use the, the term joyously to describe the way Newt engaged in some of his, the battles he, he took on. And a lot of that was, um, I think, the role that the Conservative Opportunity Society played in, yep. in helping kind of galvanize a lot of the, the energy and directing it. In, in, in legislative directions. Can you um, talk maybe a little bit about you have a, a guy coming into Congress who seemed to have this in instinct for forming um, organizational yes. structures that would facilitate his agenda and, and the agenda of the, of the conservative movement. Mm -hmm. And the COS is one element of that. But he right. did other things too, like GOPAC and so on. That's maybe right. Go into some of well, that. The, 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 the 70s, which I try to cover in detail there, are such an important decade for the American conservative movement. Except not in fashion. No, 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 no. <laughs> Every man looked like a John Travolta wannabe. You know, it's a, you know right. polyester, polyester leisure suits that labels that do not, do not wear in an open flame. <laughs> That's right. I um, think about it. Yeah, no, the fashion was awful in the 1970s. Uh, but there was some good music. Yeah, uh, but but um, the 70s come 200 years after the second mo the most important ideological debate in this country. Um, over whether or not we, we should be remain subject to the British crown or whether or not we should be free and independent. 200 years later, we have the same debate again, only it's about Washington and the national government mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and all these initiatives, Prop 13, Pan-Canal Treaties, mm -hmm. Heritage Foundation. When did Hoover start? 
1919. Okay, all right. So you, so you're, 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 you're ahead of the game. Yeah. Yeah. But all these organizations, term limits, uh, is that lots of referenda around the country. There's a lot creative conservative revolt is in across mm -hmm. the land mm -hmm. taking you know a pro-life movement comes in you know starts flexing mm -hmm. their muscles the moral majority is created in the 1970s mm -hmm. pro-family groups pro-life groups national tax uh, national conservative political action committee fund mm -hmm. for a conservative majority all these conservative organizations which are all animated by the ideas that are being generated by Hoover and by Heritage mm -hmm. and by other conservative think tanks is that conservatism and the republicanism breaks out of its of, of its trap of just being an againer you mm -hmm. know just being against democratic initiatives just being against liberal nostrums just being uh, and 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 just saying no to the party of saying yes, but it's all around the framework of freedom, personal mm -hmm. freedom, mm -hmm. rights, dignity, federalism, returning power to states and localities. Uh, and out of that comes Gingrich's, Gingrich's initiative on corruption, which had never really been part of the national political right, debate let's talk before. About that. That's important. He, well, I mean, he <laughs> mm -hmm. is that he, obviously, Watergate was about corruption. Um, but the Democratic Party, uh, that was a singular thing. That was Nixon. The media hated Nixon. He was, he was foolish. He was stupid. He did all these dumb things that eventually led to his impeachment. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously Spiro Agnew, too, was, was taking kickbacks. He was corrupt. Mm -hmm. But as far as an, an ongoing, almost a, 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 a framework of ongoing political ideology and even, you know, uh, campaigns, is that Gingrich is the first one to really develop this as an ongoing thing. Before he's even sworn in in 1978, he's already won, mm -hmm. but he's not sworn in, he starts going after Congressman Charlie Diggs from Detroit, mm -hmm. who was an incumbent, and was, was taking kickbacks from his staff. They were cashing their paychecks and then giving him so, proceeds mm -hmm. from their own pay. Mm -hmm. And Gingrich focuses attention on him and starts this national campaign that eventually leads to Diggs' uh, resignation. Mm -hmm. He then uh, goes after Freddie uh, St. Germain, who was mm -hmm. the chairman of the House Banking Committee, uh, which he, no pun intended, but he ran like his own piggy bank, mm -hmm. was taking <laughs> massive kickbacks from banks he was supposed to be regulating, mm -hmm. uh, but, but turning a blind eye. Then... He sets his sight. Now he's in. Now he's been in Congress for uh, his two terms. Mm -hmm. He's uh, wet behind the ears. You know, uh, they, he used to sit in the back. Uh, the minority uh, would sit in the back, and they called the back of the House chamber "Redneck Row." Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where he was. Mm -hmm. And he's going after Jim Wright, second in line for the presidency of the United States. Powerful, mean as a snake. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a guy you don't want to cross unless if you're going to strike at the king, you better kill him. Mm -hmm. uh, and Newt strikes at the king and eventually kills him. Jim Wright is forced to resign. He's, got, he's taking uh, money from crooked book deals, crooked cattle deals, crooked oil deals, crooked Cadillac deals. His, mm -hmm. his, you know, he's got so many deals going on, and he brings his wife in on the corruption. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time in American history that a sitting speaker is forced to resign uh, his, his seat. First time in American history. Mm -hmm. And just, just to add things, just to add... Uh, the coup de grace, he then goes after Congressman Tony Coelho mm -hmm. again and forces him to resign. So by, by the time he's knocked mm -hmm. out four Democratic congressmen, he's into his second term. Uh, this is a guy to be respected and this is a guy to be feared. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily liked, uh, but he, he's, he's you know, actually flexing his muscles way beyond mm -hmm. his station in the House of Representatives. And as a result, he enormous media attention. He's, right. in the, he's in the media every day. He's, in, he's, he's writing for the Post. Mm -hmm. He's in the New York Times. He's in the Wall Street Journal. He's on NBC News. He's on Today Show. Well, let, let's, uh, that's a good segue. Now, his role, uh, his way of using the media, two things jump out, <clears throat> but there's more. One is C-SPAN. Yes. And the other one would be yeah. um, the talk radio a little bit later than that. Yes. Maybe you could talk about um, the innovation. Well, interestingly enough, that. Newt was on the wrong side of the fairness doctrine. Mm -hmm. When Reagan let it lapse in 1988, because I, I think the idea of rationed political speech offended Reagan's 
sensibilities mm -hmm. is that political speech should not be regulated. It should anybody mm -hmm. and everybody should be able to mm -hmm. speak their mind if they, if, you know, if the marketplace will support it. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan never really wrote about it. He, but in his diaries or, or when he, when he, when he uh, let the fairness doctrine lapse. And for those of you who don't remember, the fairness doctrine used to be that AM radio used to regulate political speech, and that is is that if Mike was on Diane Reem. Only that would be FM. I was actually. Okay, yeah, I was on Di I was on Di I was on Diane Don't Reem too. Don't remind me. I know, yeah, I know, I know. I, yeah, it wasn't very pleasurable yeah. for me either. Yeah. Um, all right, okay. Uh, if 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 Mike is on the the Zareen Shirley show, uh, <laughs> is, is that they would give you five minutes as a liberal to speak, and then they had to mandate five minutes of a conservative to speak, so, and that's the way they regulated the fairness doctrine. Mm -hmm. And and Reagan let it lapse, and Newt actually was with a group of conservatives who opposed Reagan on letting the fairness doctrine mm -hmm. lapse. He obviously recognized his value very quickly as mm -hmm. not only Rush Limbaugh, but there were a thousand, as there are today, yeah, a thousand right. Rush Limbaughs, mm -hmm. you know, regional, local mm -hmm. uh, uh, radio uh, talk show hosts. So that became a mm -hmm. very, very important uh, 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 a tool, tool mm -hmm. in the rise of the conservative movement and C-SPAN, as you mentioned, because, you know, he once told Dick, mm -hmm. He said, "He said, would you go, would you give a speech to a hundred thousand people?" Mm -hmm. And Army says, "Yeah, of course." And he said, "Well, every time you go on C-SPAN, you're giving a speech to a hundred thousand people." Mm -hmm. And the Republicans quickly learned to dominate um, mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, uh, the time at special orders. Special orders, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Quickly learned to dominate the time, the special orders mm -hmm. at the end of the day, and they were all over C-SPAN, you know, denouncing yeah. liberalism, denouncing. <clears throat> Tip O'Neill denouncing Democrats. He got under Tip O'Neill's uh, yes d d normal demeanor. He he lost it. Yeah. And so he and he so was he, admonished by the House. Yeah. Yeah. The Speaker was admonished. Not yes. Dude. Right. So and he was admonished <clears throat> by the Democrats who controlled it because they looked mm -hmm. up. The, Newt and and O'Neill did not like each other, and <laughs> O'Neill used to dismiss the uh, the Reagan guys as the crazies. Or Reagan's robots, and it was it was Kemp, mm -hmm. it was uh, it was uh, uh, um, Vin, Trent, Weber. Vin Weber, Trent Lott, Cheney. Ch Dick Cheney, uh, and uh, and uh, Newt. Mm -hmm. And he, Connie Mack in that group. Connie Mack. Yeah, but he was he was more of a he was more of a late comer. Mm -hmm. He wasn't as assertive as uh, especially as Jack or mm -hmm. Vin or um, uh, uh, Bob Bob Walker too. Bob Walker. Yeah, yeah he was very assertive. In and, fact, and, he may have been more assertive than Newt. If and, that's and possible. The, uh, the member from Maryland. Oh, Bob uh, Bob Bauman. Bauman. Yeah, right. He was, yeah. He was an expert on rules. He, yes, he was. He was he was the master parliamentarian. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, <coughs> Newt and and Newt was attacking the Democrats one day from the floor, and O'Neill heard about this. He went over, went to the speaker's chair, and stormed out of his chair as Newt is attacking these. Patriotism, basically mm -hmm. the democratic patriotism, which is not against the rules of the House, but when O'Neill got out of his speaker's chair and slumbered down the the aisle and <laughs> and uh, lumbered, slumbered, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe both, yeah. but he but he screamed at Gingrich. He said, "That's the lowest thing mm -hmm. that I've ever heard in my 30 years of the House of Representatives." Well, calling a member the lowest was out of order. Mm -hmm. And so uh, O'Neill was hugely embarrassed because he had what was his, his remarks were taken down. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. He had to leave the, the floor for the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was actually two Democrats who looked up the 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 uh, thesaurus meaning of lowest and came to the the conclusion that O'Neill was out of order. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, was, it, it made all the network news. It was a huge mm -hmm. story. Yeah, yeah. You know, all, it led all three network news, and all mm -hmm. three and you know newspapers and everything else. But Gingrich won and O'Neill lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, that's that's another good segue. The one thing I thought Newt did um, well, you bring it out in the book at different junctures, is uh, creatively using the House rules to force uh, his issues that he wanted to have come front and center. Right. To have them be debated, to force members to vote on them up or down. Um, maybe talk a little bit about about his legislative tactics and how he. Um, use that to advance an agenda. Well, he was he was not the master parliamentarian, not whether mm -hmm. way, way Walker was, 
or Bob Bauman was. Mm -hmm. But they would obviously, you know, the, the, there was a conservative opportunity society, and then there was a subset of that. Mm -hmm. And they would usually meet almost every morning over breakfast, the mm -hmm. five or six of them, and plot, you know, the guerrilla tactics of the day mm -hmm. and what they were going to do of the day. They stymied a lot of Democratic legislation, and they promoted a lot of, and it, this was during the 80s. And the, the Reagan administration is an idea factory, mm -hmm. contra aid. SDI, tax cuts, balanced budget. There's something big mm -hmm. happening on the House every morning, every day. Mm -hmm. And and Bob Michael, of course, you know, God rest his soul, was the minority leader. Mm -hmm. But Bob Michael was not a revolutionary. Uh, he was he was a good singer. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, he liked to play golf with Tip. Mm -hmm. uh, but he he was not. You know, th at that point there was a there was a fissure between. In the, the, there was the old standby, you know, uh, establishment mm -hmm. Republicans and the growing number of Reagan Republicans mm -hmm. and uh, the ones that O'Neill called the crazies or the Reagan robots or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was this, this tension all the time mm -hmm. inside the House conference. Well, even how, as, to, how to proceed as a minority in legislative debates. Yes, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, do, do you get along, do you go along like Tip mm -hmm. said, or are you just just fight and use everything you can, tactics, mm -hmm. and the media, which was actually becoming a valuable ally, much as we denounce the mm -hmm. national media, but they still liked a good story. Mm -hmm. you know? And it was an inside-outside game, because yes. you, you could force votes and then use the votes with, say, talk radio allies yes. to get the word out that some 80-20 you know, issue, your member voted the wrong way, yeah. and what are you going to do about it? And that became... I think that did put a lot of pressure yeah. on the majority of the time. Well, Newt could also was uh, Newt could also turn on a dime too. I remember in 1994 mm -hmm. when the uh, when the crime bill came up, and it was sponsored by the Clinton White House. Crime was the number one issue in the country at the time, and they wanted the Democrats to campaign on doing something about crime in the fall election. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 right. a group of us actually, you did, I did, others. We organized a guerrilla campaign. Uh, to defeat the, well, we, we started calling it the Clinton crime bill because we realized mm -hmm. the name Clinton was a millstone on any legislation. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a, a procedural vote in August, and the crime bill, it shocked everybody mm -hmm. in the world. It went down to defeat mm -hmm. because we had run this whole guerrilla campaign that was outside the purview of, uh, you know, I hate the phrase off the radar screen, but... Mm -hmm. it, It'll suffice here of, yeah. of official Washington, and we were working. With, we were using faxes and and, mm -hmm. and handbills and organization and a lot of talk radio, mm -hmm. and they were just beating the bejesus out of the Clinton crime bill. There was stuffed with pork and dance lessons well, for actually, criminals. The, and that's a good point because I think that raises another thematic here that. But it's just, yeah. is that mm -hmm. Newt was actually lukewarm to mm -hmm. opposing the Clinton crime bill. Mm -hmm. But once it went down to feet, he, he, mm -hmm. he caught up very quickly. But what they did, though, is they took um, what was a crime bill and transformed it in, in the public discourse into a spending bill mm -hmm. that was full of things that weren't That's attractive right. and looked right. like they were wasteful. Right. And all of a sudden, people were weighing, well, on the one hand, I want to be tough on crime, on the other hand, Boy, you guys are wasting a lot of my money. Yeah, and and that's how they define things. And the Democrats didn't at the time didn't know no. how that had happened. They were very surprised. And uh, well, as a matter of fact, Gephardt mm -hmm. was the uh, was a Democratic whip, and he didn't even do a nose count before the vote. He was so cocksure that it was, the procedural vote would pass. Mm -hmm. He didn't even. He, yeah, right. Uh, and 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 Char and Schumer was also in the the House at the time, mm -hmm. and I think he was deputy whip. Mm -hmm. And neither of them ordered. A, a nose count before mm -hmm. the vote actually happened. So they were just blown away, astonished. Anyone here who's worked on the Hill should understand that during those years, and when Newt first came into office, you point, point this out, the, the number of Democrats in the House is 276. So the, the high mark of the Republican years recently was about 247, I think. So if you're the whip, I could have been a good whip back then. <laughs> I mean, you, could, you could lose 60 votes, 70 votes, pick up a few re Republican votes and still win. So when you don't win a vote with margins right. Whoops. Ooh, with margins at that level, um, sorry about that. No worries. Here we go. That's yeah. right. Oh, thank you. <laughs> when, you uh, when you lose those votes, More where that came that's from. a big deal to lose, to lose a vote like that. Thank you. Um, let's uh, switch over to, to maybe what we 
had discussed earlier was one of the big seminal moments that you pick up in your book, which is the big fight in 1990 over the, uh, the violation of the read my lips, no new taxes. <laughs> you, you do a very good job of eliciting all the different, the drama that was at work there. Well, it was high drama. Mm -hmm. It was. Is that uh, mistake and who is the uh, Jim Traficant uh, was in the house then before he, uh, before he, he, either, he went to time. prison or insane asylum, one or the other. He was a uh, <laughs> sheriff, I think, member of the house. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Inmate. But, but it, it, w when Bush flipped on no new taxes, read my lips, no new taxes, uh, he uh, went on the House floor that night and he said, we're going to learn tonight whether or not the death penalty is really a deterrent <laughs> to committing high crime. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Um, but it was, it was it, it, the bad blood inside the Republican Party was palpable for a long, long time. There was, mm -hmm. and Gingrich was the leader of the faction saying, gee, Bush maybe should keep his pledge, you know, to not to raise taxes. He ought to let Gr Graham Latta go, or uh, Graham Redmond go through, and let the auto automatic spending cuts go through, or find some other solution, or cut spending, or cut the budget. Mm -hmm. Besides just raising taxes, this can't be our last option, is that but the, the, uh, the, the Bushes were so incensed at Gingrich, to this day, mm -hmm. they have no contact with him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. George H.W. was in the White House for eight years and never once invited Newt over to the White House. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the intellectual mm -hmm. leaders of the Republican Party and the conservative movement was mm -hmm. never invited over in eight years. Mm -hmm. um, there, was a, there was a joke going around Washington at the time. Uh, if if George Bush is in the same room as Muammar Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, and Newt Gingrich, and he has a gun with two bullets, what does he do? What? He, he shoots Newt Gingrich twice. <laughs> I can see that's that. That's yeah. how bad. That's how, that's how bad it was. You, de uh, you described the way the split came. There's two parties, a governing party, which would be President H.W. Bush, and people like Bob Dole as well, and right. Bob Michael. Uh, and then the Revolutionary Party, which would be not just Newt, but also I think you mentioned the conservative movement writ large. Yes, yes. So at that point, this is 1990, we've had eight years of Ronald Reagan. Right. Um, how much of this was just a, a frustration that what had been fought for uh, for eight long years, I mean, even the years leading up to that, to the 80 election, seemingly was going away very quickly? It, it, was, a, it was all frustration with mm -hmm. Bush. It was all frustration with Bush is that nobody, rec nobody believed he was a conservative, nobody believed he was a movement conservative. He, he went left on a lot of things, uh, handicap and uh, uh, legislation, other mm -hmm. things like that, you know, with federal mandates yeah, right, right. Uh, to, the, to the states. ADA. Uh, not, a lot of, not everybody was in favor of the, uh, of, uh, the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of conservatives who thought, you know, we shouldn't be over there. Uh, you know, saving Kuwait is a questionable, you know, proposition. Um, is that obviously on taxes? He he broke his word. So he he had isolated himself very quickly from the conservative wing of the Republican Party, which is now mm -hmm. really the majority wing of the Republican Party. The, yeah. the minority and the establishment are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they're very much uh, in this distinct minority. Um, but <clears throat> the first go around after this long protracted fight with Bush on one side and Gingrich on the other over the Bush, uh, the Bush tax increases mm -hmm. it goes down to defeat. And again, Washington is astonished and it just elevates Gingrich now as the official leader of the opposition. Mm -hmm. Bush the next yeah. morning is, uh, is, is jogging uh, at a track nearby the White House and, he, and the, all the national TV cameras are there recording him. And somebody yells out, you know, Mr. President, what about read my lips? And as he's running by the cameras, he points to his hips and said, read my hips. Mm -hmm. Which was just complete insulting. It just mm -hmm. insulted his own promise. <clears throat> and that was seen by everybody on network news that night. And you quote, um, contemporaneous to that, uh, a blue dog Democrat, Jim Cooper of Tennessee, who still who came back to Congress after having yeah. been up for a while, as saying at this point, Newt Gingrich was the de facto Speaker of the House. Yes. So for a Democrat, a sitting Democrat, who had some years of experience already to say that was a fairly remarkable uh, point to make. Uh, I'm going to say one thing real quick about your book. One thing that's very enjoyable about it are the, um, some of your quips throughout it and some of the, your, your writing style. So one I just picked out at random was at one point you mentioned how um, Newt once compared Dick Darman to uh, Michael Dukakis, which he said was, quote, 
which was basically an assault on Darwin's manhood. <laughs> you know, you, it's a very colorful book. It's well written, and, uh, and one more reason to, to read it. Uh, the other thing, too, is, is um, another thing that maybe talk about is Newt didn't shy away from criticizing his own team, so to no, speak. No, no. Uh, you mentioned things like the, when James Watt made that unfortunate joke. Right. He, he demanded that he resign. Right. Uh, he told Reagan not to go to Bitburg. Yes. Uh, there were a few other instances like that yes. throughout that he... He just, you know, apartheid, he was very adamant about. He was very open uh, yeah. for calling for Nixon's resignation months before mm -hmm. Nixon actually resigned. Mm -hmm. So there, there, was a, there was a pattern of him, I think maybe you might argue, putting the principles or his, his, his ideology ahead of uh, making someone on his own quote unquote team feel uncomfortable. Is that a. Yeah, no, I, but mm -hmm. he's, I mean, he believes in party loyalty, but up to a point. Is that I don't think that, you know, he would, he would not throw himself on the funeral pyre. In the name of party unity, especially if the the, the funeral pyre is for somebody who was wrong. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So now let's go a little f beyond that. We have the aftermath of 1990, and now you're we're into the um, kind of the final days where Bob Michael was no longer really a factor in the House. Newt was mm -hmm. not. He was definitely the de facto minority right. leader, um, and he started. People started actually thinking openly. In fact, one of the folks in today's uh, meeting, Michael Barone, I think wrote a column. You quote where he started looking at some of the numbers in certain Democratic races, yes. saying it, it's conceivable, 1994. 55, 55 seats, yeah. Michael wrote in June, July. July. And, you, and right. you named the number 55, did you not? Yeah, yeah. yeah. which was, you know, that's a remarkable thing to hear. There were two kinds of people in Washington at the time, those who thought that the Democrats would forever control the House of Representatives, right. and those who thought there might be a possibility to see some other outcome. Yeah, but most people yeah. like that were seen mm -hmm. as being just delusional. You know, delusional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll get their normal off-year election, mm -hmm. you know, get you know, 20, 25, 30, but to you mm -hmm. know, pick up that sizable number was, and that wasn't just the House or even the Senate. Mm -hmm. It was everything. Right. It was governorships, it was the legislature, is that not a Republican lost in mm -hmm. Uh, November of, of 74, not, not, not Republican, mm. you know, medical examiners, not Republican uh, funeral directors, no, nobody lost. So I, I, I just, I, I did say that. The 1992 election results, you listed, there were 18 Republican governors, I think today is either 34 or 35, right. the West Virginia switch. The House, there were 176 Republicans, today there's about 240. Uh, state legislative chambers, 29, were Republican, today it's something like 68 or 69. So you see the, the difference from then to now. Yes. You're in that environment, right? Um, yet he was optimistic in, in spite of the party being a, one of the lowest ebbs it was at, maybe alongside of the post-Watergate. Well, I think he understood. He, I think, I mean, they, everybody got on board um, uh, with the contract because they saw it as a unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that they had the Democrats. With, you know, Clinton's popularity was low. Uh, the, the economy was not doing well. Uh, there was Hillary Care was a disaster. Mm -hmm. It was politically un, 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 uh, you know, unpalatable. Hillary herself was 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 very very unpopular, and she was a factor mm -hmm. because she was in policy. Mm -hmm. So she was a public factor. She was fair and, game. She was fair game. She, she absolutely sure. Yeah. She put yeah. herself out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, but he but he recognized that it wasn't enough. You know, because most of your elections are. Uh, vote us in because the other guy is no good. Mm -hmm. But this was this was an election that says, vote us in because we got better ideas than the other guys. So it was mm -hmm. the first time anybody ever really nationalized an off-year election. It was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we have, um, you know, just maybe go back a little bit. We have the um, the contract period. I, I just, yes. I just want to, you have a sure. nice section toward the end on the the spring, the summer, the fall of 1994. Um, a lot of us here. Remember that in different, from different vantage points, and um, we're going to answer this question, then we're going to go to the Q&A. So the, the whole contract, how, how it unfolded, the significance of it, some of the naysaying that right. was out there at the time, right. go into that a little bit. Well, I mean, there were, there were a lot of people who were against Gingrich doing it because they thought it might backfire, and it would give Democrats, and the Democrats mm -hmm. thought also it would give them something to talk about to attack the Republicans with and get off the defensive. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a lot of... Uh, opposition. I would say there was more support, um, especially among the conservatives, the revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. Dick was, a, you know, was an ardent supporter. Uh, Vin, mm -hmm. Bob, uh, others, Dan, uh, uh, not Dan Quayle, but 
Crane. Bob Walker, yeah, right. And Crane. Phil, yeah, and mm -hmm. Phil Graham. Mm -hmm. uh, is that they were all very, uh, you know, the ones who were offensively minded. Uh, you know, Olympia Snow, who's no mm -hmm. wild that conservative, was was very early supporter of the contract mm -hmm. because you saw it as a vehicle for Republicans to talk about their form of governance, whether it's just attacking Democrats over their form of governance. So, something else about the contract, from my experience, which is that the the moderate faction of House Republicans then were so disdainful of the effort. They Bob thought, Dole was disdainful. And, and on the House side, too. Yes. And they were very disdainful, and they didn't think it had any chance of success. So they stayed out of it. They said, have fun. Do what you want to do. And, and as a result, the final product was a whole lot more coherent and kind of almost pure right. than if you'd had to have a negotiation with all the moderate members. They would have ins inserted certain things that would have maybe watered down or taken the theme out of the pudding. And I think that yes. made it more and, powerful. And, and also there was widespread uh, disgust with the corruption, mm -hmm. with the House Bank, mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with, right. the, with the, 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 uh, the post office, the House post office. Mm -hmm. And by this time, talk radio is now firmly established as a political force. And so everybody mm -hmm. in America knows about all these, mm -hmm. all these uh, scandals that, mm -hmm. are, that are going on. And so this also animates the, uh, the voting population. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's... Um at this point, let's turn it to the q and I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions as well. Michael. Michael Brown with the Washington Examiner and AEI. Um, my sense is Newt has always been an optimist. I think back in the 84 cycle, he was predicting that the Republicans were going to win a majority in the House in that cycle, and in 86 and 88, <laughs> and 90 and 92. Well, he had all the right reasons in mind. The Watergate babies from Democrats in 74 would retire, would seek other office, fall by the wayside, that uh, the um, southern, old southern de conservative Democrats would re retire and be replaced by Republicans, et cetera. Um, when do you think he started to get the idea of the majority? If I got the dates roughly correct, and uh, of course everybody thought that, that, everybody else thought that was a foolishly optimistic point of view. But when did he start? I, I would say even before he was elected to Congress. He, he talked about, even before he was elected to Congress, when he was uh, teaching at West Georgia, he talked about one day becoming Speaker of the House. He was, he was that focused <laughs> on that. You know, he, he was crazy. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 but smart. Yeah. But, 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 it was, but he was talking about that even before he was elected to Congress, about Republicans one day taking control of Congress. I think he saw also the, the Democratic Party in the South was changing, just the Republican Party was the South, and that would provide the numbers needed for an actual Republican majority from, from, the, uh, from the Deep South, from the Cotton South. It struck me I was there... Uh I hadn't quite got to the Hill in the spring of 89 when Newt was uh, elected whip. And by one vote. By one vote. And um, mm -hmm. my memory of the stories I've been told was that, that one vote was Henry Hyde's vote uh, because he wanted to be whip and he had told Bob Michael, I want to be whip. And instead, Michael went with Ed Madigan as his mm -hmm. choice, another Illinois guy. And that in the secret ballot, uh, Hyde. Uh, went with Newt and it and one by one vote. I wondered if you told that story in here. Uh, I haven't heard that. I mean, I ha I didn't. I don't know if I wrote that. But I had heard that, but I think also is that the real maybe the real reason Newt won and Madigan lost was because the Bush White House was so heavy-handed in their meddling of the election and the the House. Like the Senate is very parochial, you know. Is is that we're, you know, there's things we'll talk to the president about, well, things we'll talk to the White House, but the other things, the, pre the they need to back away. They need to leave us alone. And everybody it, from Bush made it clear how much he d didn't like Gingrich. Went so publicly, um, they sent Dan Quayle up to the House to try to kind of patch <laughs> things up and get some conservatives to come over to support Madigan, and that backfired badly, badly, badly. Uh, Sununu and Darman were actually uh, under house arrest. They were so, <laughs> no, no, but they, but, the, but they were so arrogant and they were so bumptious and they were so uh, disdainful of the, of the pr uh, prerogatives of the house is that every time they'd, they'd go up to the, uh, they'd go up to Capitol Hill, Bush would lose another 10 members supporting them. 
is that it, it, they just, so so there came a time where, where Sununu and Dharma were told, no, do not go to Capitol Hill because we can't afford more losses. Mm -hmm. So, but I think because they were so open in supporting Madigan, you know, they were giving him money and endorsements and all this, and they were quite open in their support. And actually, um, the rumor is is that Bush was so mad about the election of Newt as whip over Madigan, he refused to speak to his political director for six months. So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. it, was, it was very bitter, mm -hmm. very bitter. Craig Joe Alexander, good to be with you as always. Yep. Explain the working relationship between Leader Dole and Speaker Gingrich. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Uh, is um, it didn't start out well, and it got worse when Newt once called uh, Bob Dole the tax collector for the welfare state. Uh, so it was not very um, not well received. Huh? Not well received. Uh, it, no, it, it, and it's interesting too, is because they were very culturally similar as far as blue collar, military, mm -hmm. uh, rural, um, uh, you know, climbing, you know, up by their own, no mm -hmm. heavy hand of, of, mm -hmm. of nobility or station in life, mm -hmm. is that they should have gotten along better. Mm -hmm. But, but Newt, Newt was more of just a revolutionary than Dole was. Dole was, you know, his attitude was the Senate was, was uh, first of all, House members didn't meddle in the Senate, and sometimes Newt did, uh, and that, that rankled, you know, is that if you wanted to talk to Trent Lott over in the Senate, then you had to call Newt, or uh, Bob Dole first, mm -hmm. and, and Newt wouldn't do that, and so that rankled uh, Dole, and it's just that he mm -hmm. was just more of a revolutionary, although I will say in Bob Dole's defense is that he, would, you know, when it came to 94 in the contract, after he got over his initial skepticism, he was right there. Uh, and you know, uh, fighting for it and supporting it, and uh, the first person uh, on election night to congratulate Newt Gingrich on being elected speaker, even as Bob Dole was being elected majority leader, was Bob Dole mm -hmm. called Newt to congratulate him. So, so mm -hmm. you know, it, it was it was oil and water, mm -hmm. but Dole was also could be very gracious. The staff had trouble. At the staff. Level. Yes, the staff had trouble. Yes, to be yeah. Understate yeah. that. Yeah. There's a question over there. Um, hi. So Newt Gingrich continues to play an important role in American politics and played a pretty significant role in this last election. Yes. How has he evolved? And do you think that the early Newt would support the current Newt? Um, and, and just how, how do you think he's shifted? And that's another way of also asking, is there going to be a volume two, Craig? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's a great question. Um, yeah. Uh, at some point, <laughs> I, got, I got to get through another couple, three, four books. Um, but I am think I am thinking about it. The reaction to the this book has been has been good, so it kind of gratifies me to, to mm -hmm. think that maybe I should do the speakership because there's so much going on. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there's Hillary Care and there's Clinton impeachment and Newt's you know eventual ouster and the revolutionaries who take him on. There's just mm -hmm. so much high drama and yeah, the contract and everything the, else and mm -hmm. the, the election of '96. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm thinking I probably need to do that to complete the story. Um, that's interesting you mentioned that, um, Janine. <laughs> Is that if you think about American politics, and, and you know, who have, been, who have had long-lasting impact on the national political debate? Henry Clay, without being president of the United States, 20, mm -hmm. 20 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, William Jennings Bryant, 20, 30 years. But most political leaders who have had long-lasting impact have been presidents. Nixon from the 40s right up to his passing. Reagan from the 40s right up to his passing. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt for quite a while before his presidency and after his presidency. Uh, but on the other hand, Abraham Lincoln is only on the national stage for seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, uh, but Gingrich has been a national political figure since the late, the late 70s, right up till today. Mm -hmm. He's going to Kiev tomorrow to give a, a, a national to give a speech to a, a group of uh, national and international experts on, on, on security. Mm -hmm. You know, he's 73 years old, and he's going to Kiev, uh, and, and then he's going to meet with the ambassador later after that to consult on security forces and things like that. But is that you are hard-pressed to think of a political leader who has been on the national stage for as long as Gingrich and had as long an <coughs> impact mm -hmm. as Newt Gingrich, including with Donald Trump. Is that, you know, Giuliani got cast by the wayside. 
uh, uh, um, uh, who's New Jersey governor? Chris Christie. Yeah, I can think of, is it what, 7% approval? Is that what it is? <laughs> Chris Christie got cast no. aside, mm -hmm. uh, kind <clears throat> of. But, but Gingrich is still, you know, being sought after for his advice mm -hmm. by Trump and his staff. Not that Trump is taking it, but, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> there it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Becky. The great Becky Dunlop. <laughs> Yay. Uh, Craig, if Newt Gingrich had not become conservative, would he still have become influential? Yes. Counterfactual history. Yes. Yes. I think so. I think the force of his personality and his intellect is such that he could figure out how to make the argument that way, the left way. Uh, and do it very rationally and do it very uh, competently. And, you know, we might not like his argument, but we would say, that's, a, that's, that's an intelligent man who thinks about things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think he would, yeah. Right. I, you, were think, you mentioned about Newt's analysis of the South and it went back. And one of the things I th thought about as you said that was that he, he wasn't really from the South no. originally. But he had gone to college at Tulane and grad school at Emory. He'd sort of, from the campus, which would have been a different attitude than you'd get in a Georgia County seat or something. Right. He would have had a certain, he would have developed certain views and things of the South and insights into it. Um, does he ever talk about that? Does, do you he, get a he, sense of yes, that? Yes, yeah. You know, um, just, a, just a, for the backstory. But Mike is that um, he came to me and asked me to do this book. Um, is, he saw my books on Reagan and that, and he came to me, and I and I and I said yes. Uh, uh, obviously, I was flattered, but also I'd seen what had been written about Gingrich, which is very, very bad stuff, written mostly by liberals, uh, full of uh, venom and uh, canards, and uh, and I, you know, is that he clearly is in the last 50 years one of the four most important conservatives in, in American history, alongside. Goldwater, Buckley, and Reagan. He's just had too much impact on, on the Republican Party and the conservative movement for too long. Uh, and so I don't think there's any doubt. I thought he deserved a better treatment from history than, than what we've been getting so far mm -hmm. uh, from the left. So that's, that's why I want to do it, to do it fair and accurate instead of, uh, you know, with, 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 uh, with, you know, lies or whatever else you, you do it. So we used to meet at the Basilica every Sunday morning Callisto would mm. practice in the choir and then sing mm. uh, for the service. Mm. And he and I would meet in the cafeteria mm. uh, every Sunday morning for months on end. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd have breakfast or just coffee or whatever. But I would just mm. interview him endlessly, just everything, you know. Mm -hmm. just, uh, and, and we did talk about his thoughts about the South and his influence of the South. Is that, you know, is that, yes, he was born in Harrisburg, but he moved around a lot. And a lot of Southern enlisted men, a lot of Southern officers, you know, in, say, the 50s and the, and the 40, 40s, 50s, you know, 60s, were from the South. So that had an impact on him. Also, after he starts teaching at West Georgia, he starts ta uh, teaching Bible lessons at a local Baptist, college, or local Baptist church. So he does immerse himself in many ways, is that he, he, he's a kind of a chameleon. He can, he can, you know, talk the talk of the campus, although he was quickly, you know, <laughs> more conservative than, than other college professors, but also just the surrounding culture of Georgia itself and, and New Orleans is that this also, uh, I think, uh, had an impact. And he, and he realized that the, the South was, was democratic, but also conservative. And if you could pry away if you, you say, look, National Democrats don't represent you anymore. They're off, you know, you know, you know, supporting the NDK in North Vietnam and uh, in the Vietnamese War and, and all these other things. They don't represent you anymore. Is that he saw that the, the Southern Democrats could be pried away from the National Party. You know, and one of the themes in your book, too, is just the South, you know, the re transformation of the South politically. And just you mentioned that in 1994, uh, there were 50 Democrats and 34 Republicans from the southern states. 2017, the number of Democrats had dropped to 39, and the Republicans had gone from 34 to 101. 
So you talk about a, a, a yeah. transformation of a region. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. In, in one was, generation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's re quite remarkable, actually. We have time for one last question, perhaps, or otherwise we can uh, return to our festivities and date night. Well, thank you all for coming, and please thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.